that shouldn't be just a mouthpiece for Shopsmith. That should be legitimate woodworking information. And we simply build the stuff with the Shopsmith. Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com. Here, here, once again, is in my apartment. But I'm here for a good reason, and that is because I have a wonderful guest with me here today, and uh, that's Mr. Nick Engler. Just by way of a quick introduction, let me tell you that Nick is an author. Nick is a, a video personality. Um, he's been involved at, uh, well, I don't know, we'll get into his, his shopsmith history here, but that was my first introduction to him was back when I was new to the company, and he had already left the company and, and has ton of history and experience that relates to us shopsmith nerds that tend to hang out on this channel. But uh, love to get into some detail on what all is going on with Nick. But first, I have to tell you, if you don't already know about, about his YouTube channel, you need to be watching right now the Workshop Companion. But with that, let me go ahead and hand it to Nick and say, Nick, tell us about yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. That was a wonderful introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Um, I'm uh, I'm as uh, an old woodworker uh, like your like yourself. I uh, uh, very early on I grew absolutely enamored with the material. I used to uh, follow my grandfather around. He built he built houses one at a time. He was not a he was not a construction person, but he would buy up a lot, build a house, sell the house, and then buy another lot and do it all over again. And uh, we had a uh, we had a pact, he and I, when I got to be old enough to actually swing a hammer myself, he said, OK, you work for me for one weekend and I'll take you hunting and fishing the next weekend. And we did that. We did that throughout my childhood. It was a wonderful childhood because uh, I'd be building stuff one weekend and I'd be hunting and fishing for stuff the next weekend. And so that's yeah, uh, awesome. Where were you? Where, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, um, and uh, uh, my grandfather was the head maintenance engineer for Area C of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and uh, so he he knew which end of a screwdriver to hang on to, and uh, uh, he 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 taught me. My 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 father was a physicist, taught physics at the uh, University of Dayton, and. Uh, uh, was not nearly as good with tools, but uh, I, I feel I got I got the uh, the best of both worlds. I've got the hands on from my granddad, and I got the theory from my from my dad. So uh, here I am. I'm a I'm a uh, I, I taught uh, wood as an engineering material at the University of Cincinnati just for the just because of those two people. So. And, and you live now in West Milton. I live in West Milton, a little teeny tiny town uh, outside of outside of Dayton. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's set beautifully in 1952 or 53. Uh, you 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 actually pass through the the time warp as you're as you're uh, coming into town. You know, suddenly you're you're in a in a in a bow tie and knickers. You know, so it it but it's a uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a nice little town where everybody knows everybody else's business so uh, i've been in west milton and and the bow tie was kind of off-putting i, I didn't yeah. expect that <laughs> <laughs> it's not nearly as bad as when we sacrificed the virgins at the end of, at the uh summer season. <laughs> but uh i'm thankful i was there after i got married then so <laughs> um uh, I am in my apartment right now. My wife and I are between houses, which is also why my shop is currently in my sister's basement. But uh, as I was looking around the apartment uh, this morning, I thought, oh, I've got to show Nick. I actually have two of your books here in the apartment. Right? <laughs> okay. And, 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 I, and I thought, you know what? I probably shouldn't even show you this. But then I realized, no, I'm going to. Do you know why this is the only issue of your series that I have in my apartment? No, uh, maybe, maybe so for, because <laughs> I'm gonna say for, for those who don't know, Nick has a series of books called the the Workshop Companion, and this is the index. Uh, it's because I get asked questions all the time, and I'll jump there and say, "Hey, and if you don't have it, you're gonna want to buy Nick's Sanding book," and he references <laughs> this on page eighty five. Um, I use I use that almost as much now as I was using the whole volume of books which I had for years. Yeah. Uh, what well, wonderful, wonderful works. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 it's, it's always amazing to meet somebody who actually, uh, actually uh, uh, is familiar with my books. You know, we, we I was, um, one of the things I grew up with besides, uh, besides uh, uh, building houses and, and hunting and fishing is I, I, uh, I had an ambition to, to write, you know, my, I had a father who was a physicist, a theorist, and a grandfather who, who uh, knew how to work with his hands. But I had a grandmother who was a poet. And uh, she got me interested in putting in stringing words together so that they actually made sense. And uh, so from the third grade, I, I wanted to be an author. Um, and uh, uh, I grew up, I grew up uh, always wanting to write books. And it was, it was a real heartbreak for me when, when uh, the internet uh, killed what we were doing. I mean, we, we were, we were put, we had put out about 75 books out of my, I had a, a book production company. We weren't a publisher. We didn't have an imprint. Uh, but what we did is we put together books for other uh, publishers and then it, um, they would, they would put their imprint on it. For example, the book you just showed had Rodale's imprint on, on it, but we produced it at uh, my little shop in West Milton. Bookworks, right? Is it Bookworks? Bookworks. Bookworks was the name okay. of it. Uh, and just uh, seven people, all extremely good at what they did. Uh, and uh, uh, we just put out one book after another. But by we we began uh, we began experiencing some real problems around 1995. And by the year 2000, everything that we used to write about for money was for free on the Internet. So. Mm. That's why I'm here. I, if you can't yeah, beat them, but, join them. But not exactly, though. This is the thing that I've learned is you you almost need a curator of that content because there's so much out there and it's not all good. Yeah, yeah. That's that is the that is the problem with the uh, um, with the uh, with the the content on the internet. When when I was uh, when I was working with publishing companies, they were the gatekeepers, and um, the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, they would, they would, I was always assigned an editor who knew, uh, about woodworking. Often I was assigned an editor who was as good a work woodworker as I was. And, uh, then there, we were able to put out really good stuff because of it. But in the, in the internet, there's absolutely no filter whatsoever. The good and the bad come to come across just the same. And, uh, that's going to that's going to be a problem sooner or later. There's going to have to be a way either either we're going to have to teach people uh, to think critically or we're going to have to we're going to have to fi uh, figure out some way for people to know what information can be trusted and when this person is just a horse's ass. You know? <laughs> that's true. OK, we're going to come back around to all this, but I figure we, we probably ought to plug in your shopsmith experience here for folks mm -hmm. that are wondering when we're going to talk about that. When did you come to work at ShopSmith? Um, and I, I have a rough idea about when you started, but just fill me in on that. Well, I, it was it was right after they invented chisels, and uh, it it, uh, it it was seventy nine, was, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it was nineteen. <laughs> yeah, no, it was uh, nineteen seventy nine. I was I was living in North Carolina. I had gone down there because uh, living was cheap and and the scenery was beautiful. And I was, I had a, uh, uh, a business, I was making musical instruments, uh, 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 traditional American musical instruments, mostly dobros and banjos and dulcimers. Uh, and the, uh, uh, on, the, on the side, I was beginning to build up a freelance writing business. I was, I was stringing for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and several other newspapers, as well as some magazines. And uh, uh, my brother called me up from, from Dayton, Ohio, and he says, hey, there's an ad in the paper for a woodworking writer editor. I said, really? So I came back up to Dayton, Ohio, and I interviewed a chopsmith. And the next thing I knew, I was, um, I was designing a one advertiser magazine for them called Hands On. And uh, they, they uh, started that magazine and... Uh, uh, I was with them for four or five years until I decided to uh, get out and get into books. 
Now, prior to that, they had something of what I would really categorize more as a newsletter. I, I have an issue of it right here, which is uh, which is Shavings Magazine. Oh, Shavings, and, yeah. I, yeah. I put out the very last issue of Shavings. That was the first thing I did when I got there. And uh, we, 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 wrapped up, we wrapped up Shavings and uh, uh, we redesigned the magazine. What, what I wanted to do, and uh, uh, Larry, Larry Blank was, uh, was the head marketer. He was the vice president of marketing at the time. And a really, really forward-looking guy. And I showed him all the, all the one advertiser magazines that were coming out at the time. In particular, I showed him one from the United States Army. Uh, and I said, now look, look, you go here and, and the ads are, are different from the editorial. You can go through this and you can read editorial. You're getting good information without people trying to get you to join the army. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now if we go in over here is the ad. I said, let's do hands on the same way. Let me do the editorial. You produce the ads. We'll put it together just like a normal magazine. And uh, Larry said, yeah, let's do that. Uh, and, uh, so shavings died. Hands-on was born. Uh, Hands-on was actually Larry's uh, name for the magazine. And, uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sharing, I'm sharing my screen right now. Uh, who's, who's the young kid sitting there in that picture? <laughs> oh God. Yeah, that was where, where let's see. That's, that's so, not. This is this is the last issue of shavings. Yes. All right. So this is talking about the introduction of hands up launching launching a new magazine, launching hands on magazine. Right, right. I had uh uh okay, Vince, Vince, I had forgotten all about Vince and uh, <laughs> anyway, yep, there there that's uh that's me. Uh my hair even back then my hair wouldn't behave. So uh, anyway, Sorry, that, didn't, didn't mean to throw you off with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have that. I, I just, I haven't, I probably, I, I, uh, I have all the hands-ons, but I don't have that last issue I'll, of shaving. I'll send, I'll send it to you. Uh, not a problem at all. So, all right. So you, so you came in specifically for that role to, to, to convert what was shavings to hands-on magazine. Cool. And that, that magazine had quite a run, but for sure, in the years that you were there, it, it was the legit woodworking magazine. It predated wow. Better Homes and Gardens woodworking magazine or wood magazine and, well, and many others. That's what I, that's what I told, I, I, what Larry and I agreed to, that this ought to be, a, this, this shouldn't be just a mouthpiece for Shopsmith. This should be legitimate woodworking information and we simply build the stuff with the shopsmith. And uh, uh, Larry bought into it. And uh, uh, three issues later, he had a million dollars in sales per issue. So. Oh my gosh. It worked. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, so, so just so you know, in, in 1979, while I was still in high school, I graduated in 81. Uh -huh. I visited Shopsmith for the very first time, and I have issues of Hands On Magazine in my name to my childhood address from 1979. <laughs> so uh -huh. uh, I've been been enjoying your work since those days. So. Well, we we uh, we we had a good we had a good run. It was it was it was pretty it was pretty good up and up. Um, you know, I I left. For various reasons, but mostly because um, uh, Popular Science uh, Books had offered me a job as senior editor there, and I, I, I really wanted to write some books, and uh, uh, I figured that a good way of, of getting into it was to edit them first. And uh, uh, I met <laughs> my first book, the first book I, I, I was I was supposed to edit. Popular uh, Popular Science wanted to do a uh, um, an, what it's what's called an annual. That was a big thing back in the days when right. people read. Um, you would get an annual book that would have all these uh, all this information that you cared about. You know, if it was guns or hunting or or woodworking, it all be right there. And so um, I was supposed to edit this, and a person who had been a a woodworking writer for many 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 years. 
uh, was hired to to write it. He was in um, he was in Missouri, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, uh, he was got a little behind for various reasons. And uh, uh, I kept coming into editorial meetings and I'm saying, I'm not hearing from Jay. I'm not hearing from Jay. I don't have any chapters. I don't have any chapters. And finally, the book, the book was due to be to, at the printers in two months and two weeks, 10 weeks. I had, I had to get this book out. And I told them, I said, let me go back home to Dayton, Ohio. I haven't sold my house. I still have my shop. I can put this book out. So I came back. I gathered uh, up some of the people that I had worked with at ShopSmith, uh, notably uh, my uh, designer, Linda Watts, uh, who, who designed that magazine. She was absolutely fantastic. And uh, I, I had it at the printers three days late. And they were they were still able to make uh, to make the printer was able to uh, to uh, get it all bundled up and uh, uh, on the docks when the when pop science needed it. So I came back in and uh, uh, they said to me, Nick, that was a fine job. You're fired. I said, what? <laughs> I said, they said, you are worth a whole lot more to us as an author than you are as an editor. So we'll uh, we'll uh, we're going to fire you, but we're going to buy every book you're going to write. So oh, well, that I was <laughs> now. I remember there was a time where you'd go to a shopsmith demo, uh, uh -huh. you know, in a mall, a home center, and one of the promotions to get you to come, you know, bring you bring your coupon, you'd get a popular science yearbook, and it had a, a shopsmith logo on it, and some of the components inside were were shopsmith tools. Were you involved in that? Um. That ring a bell? I, I may have been the shopsmith when I was writing the yearbooks for Popular Science. Shopsmith picks them, picked them up, and and branded them. Um, uh, basically, basically put out a shopsmith edition. And I, what I did is uh, Popular Science wanted me to use a variety of tools, so instead I I pulled all the all the pictures where they showed uh, me doing things uh, on other tools. And uh, I pasted in uh, the same picture on a shopsmith, and okay. that that became so. So you you might have used some of those as to uh, to uh, to some of those uh, shopsmith branded pop science books. That I know that those were used is. in sales. Yeah, so. it must be exactly what it is. Okay, so how about in your shop? I was, I was going to ask you. I know you have some shopsmith tools around. It looks like you you pulled them right into the picture here. So well, what sure. shopsmith tools actually see some use in your shop? Well, I, I have I have that uh, old brownie behind me um, and the uh, uh, that has been updated uh, with uh, a power pro uh, headstock. It's it's if you, you take off that headstock, you'll you'll it's it's that uh, that nice little DVR motor that they're putting out right now. And uh, uh, then I have I have a, a six inch bandsaw. And um, I have, I have a, I actually have, I have two and a half shopsmiths. I have one over at home that I use in my home shop. And then I have one, uh, the one behind me here, we use mostly as a lathe. Mm -hmm. um, we, it, it makes a, I mean, that DVR motor makes a really, really good lathe. And I mean, you can get it, you can put some big, huge chunks of wood on that and get it running real slow so that you don't have the vibration. Um, but, uh, uh, one of the tools that we use the most is a, is a chopped up shopsmith that I put together and made it into a sanding station. Travis is going to go over and see if he can get it, if he can get it uh, back behind here. Um, many years ago, I went looking for a combination disc and belt sander, uh, for, for my shop and could not find anything that does it as well as a shopsmith does. Everything had, they, they stuck this uh, uh, 3750 motor on it, you know, so that it, it ran way too fast, burned right. the wood. Uh, and, and of course it was, a, it was a direct drive motor. So, so um, uh, it, just, it just screamed at you. Uh, so I took one of my old shopsmiths, an old um, um, Mark 500, uh, cut it down, 
remounted it. Here it comes. I'll show it to you here in a minute. Oh my goodness. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you've got- Thank you, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> you've got, you've got a, a uh, uh, your, your, uh, here we go. You've got your disc sander here, your belt sander here, and your belt sander has a PTO on it, so you can put a drum sander out here. Uh, yeah. You can run at at uh, whatever speed that you want. You can use, I've, as you can see, I've got the conical disc on here, so I've, that's something that you can't do with uh, with uh, uh, those combined drum and belt sanders that you you can buy. Uh, if I wanted to, I could sl I could uh, uh, swap out this for a strip sander. So um, or and anything actually. I mean, this this would also serve as a uh, as an SPT stand if I wanted it to. But uh, it, it, I mean, it, it gets this sees a lot of work. All, you're looking at our sanding station here. It makes a great sanding station. I've often when I was when I was at Shopsmith, both my first and second time, I said we are really ought to do this. We could we could be selling standalone sanding stations, but that it, it fell on deaf ears. So well, they, they did just introduce what they call the Mark IV, which is a bench of event, uh, basically is a shorty, right? So it's the 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 standard headstock, the sa standard base and legs, but with mm -hmm. shortened way tubes and bench tubes. But you you've even eliminated your bench tubes, so you could completely utilize the space below for cabinetry. It appears, well, I, which I you have. Let see. me put it back far enough that yeah. you can see. Yeah, it's, that's great. It's, it's all it sees so that it's all storage beneath it that's yeah. that's one of the that's one of the things i i, I my shopsmith at home has a cabinet beneath it, it it's that I, I every tool that i have in my shop like this like this bands over here has a cabinet beneath it that's 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 free storage space i yeah. the, there is nothing so wasteful as a as a power tool stand you know, it's just <laughs> so it's just air in your shop that you don't need. So, so um, true. anyway, anyway, that's that's. Uh, so, so we have. Go ahead. What 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 is your favorite thing to do in woodworking? Then, if you could, it, it, you know, removing all barriers, um, you know, the setup, the cleanup, all that. What is the thing that you would most love to do this afternoon in woodworking? Go wood shopping, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I jump in my truck and go out to the to the Sawyers and say, "What do you got for me?" Oh, so, uh, have, I mean, you I, ever, have you ever gone wood shopping with Scott Phillips? No, never have. You you need to. The guy can choose trees that are still on the hoof and knows exactly uh, what he's buying because he used to work for. Well, uh, that's what he used, used to do soul. before. You, yeah, but before he was with Shopsmith, but. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I really, I really don't have a favorite thing. I like to see stuff come together, and quite frankly, one of the one of the things that I've always done in my woodworking is I've gathered people together that I enjoy working with, and what I, I enjoy teaching, uh, I enjoy working with good, competent people. I enjoy, uh, I enjoy being part of a group where the uh, whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, Bookworks it was that way. The workshop companion is that way. So um, the, uh, uh, we, you get the right groups of, uh, of, of talented, competent people together and you can do amazing things like those books. So, yeah. Which part do you like to play? If you're gonna put yourself in the middle of a team and a team of competent people, what is, what is your main role then? Conductor? Well, no, you know, uh, you could call a conductor. I, uh, somebody once asked me that question and I said, I said, uh, I'm the Indian chief, you know, okay. you know, that, that, that's, that's, you know, the, uh, when we decide where to look for the Buffalo, I decide where to look for the Buffalo, but mostly we're just on a big adventure and I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of leading the way. I'm the one that takes the risk so that everybody else can have a good time. So that's that's what we're that's that's what we're doing. You know, I uh, the the craziest thing I ever did in in my life was I started a whole company that that built old airplanes. 
we, yeah, I see we, on your shirt. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the Wright Brothers <laughs> Airplane Company. Uh, and it's amazing uh, how many really uh, incredible people came to work with me just because we were doing something so far off the uh, off the beam that the uh, that you couldn't use a level. I mean, we were just yeah. we were just nuts. The I, uh, I actually have a question. I, I wrote this down because we moved here. I'm following your path, but backwards. We moved to North Carolina 20 years ago, so in 1999, uh, and not long after, you started posting because the 100 year anniversary of flight was coming, and your website began. I was so jealous. I just wanted to be there with you and, and working with you. So tell me about that, about that whole project and what you what you guys did. Well, okay. Basically, basically, we uh, Bookworks was winding down because of the internet, um, and we were looking around. I was a pilot. Uh, I'm I'm a, a mid time pilot. I have about uh, a thousand hours in a in an old Cherokee, and um, the uh, I, I'm from Dayton, Ohio. So, uh, you know, I, I basically grew up with the Wright brothers in my backyard and the centennial of flight was coming up at the same time that, that, uh, we were finding it hard to, to sell books. And, uh, I said, you know, Dayton is going to need a set of Wright brothers airplanes. There are no Wright brothers airplanes in Dayton, except this old, airplane that was built in uh, 1912 and they had chopped up and done some other stuff with it, but there was no Wright Brothers. Is that the one at Caroline Park, Caroline Park? Well, that was, that was, that was the one that was, that was uh, uh, still okay. But there was, there were, there was no 1903s or any of the, uh, of the, of the aircraft leaning up to that, that they had done. The 1903 flyer was the first airplane off the, off the mark. I, I shouldn't say there were no Wright Brothers airplanes. There was, there was the, there, there was the one at Carolyn Park. But right, the, right, Pat, they, right, Pat had one that was, was and that was, the one that, that was the one that I was talking about that had been chopped up. It didn't even have oh, a right okay. on it anymore. Uh, they had put ailerons. The Wright brothers used wing warping, and and they had put ailerons on it. It just it was just um, actually Orville Wright once looked at that airplane and said, "That's a mongrel, you know, <laughs> it, not a Wright airplane. It's a mongrel." But uh, uh, I I I always love the story, and I said I said it's you know for I think in three dimensions, so I think we could tell this story if we built all of the seven experimental airplanes that the Wright brothers made between 1899 and uh, 1905 and had them sitting next to each other. In fact, we designed this, um, this uh, uh, display where you would wander through and, and uh, you know, I, I said you go back to 1952 when you come to West Milton. Well, you would wander through the years. You would, you would start out at 1878 uh, with the Wright brothers' uh, first little rubber band powered helicopter that they made, and then you would go into their their printing business and their newspaper business and their and their bicycle business, and finally you would end up in 1899 where they make their first kite, and they in 1900 where they start with their gliders, and finally 1903, 1904, 1905. In 1905, they ended up with a practical airplane, and I said, let's build that, and. My wife said, you're nuts, but let's do it. I, I, I have a wonderful wife, I, just a wonderful wife. She is much more practical than I, than I am, yet she'll still see the fun that there is to have if, if you, you do would it. You, would you say she's your favorite? No, <laughs> and then some. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, she, <laughs> as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, she has made me look good my whole professional life. You go through my books, those those books that you showed. She designs the furniture and the woodworking projects in them. Uh, she does all the illustrations. When we did the airplane, she covered all the airplanes. So it, so everybody would always come in and look at my air, the airplanes and say, my God, that, that cotton is stretched tight. Yep, uh, the, she did that. Yeah, but, so uh, just for, for people who are wondering what I was hinting at there, uh, your wife's name is? Mary Jane favorite. We don't, <laughs> we don't share Jane the same favorite. last name as uh, she, she, <laughs> she has, she has her own books and her own illustrations. And, and yep. uh, uh, so uh, she kept her name. 
uh, I kept mine, and uh, but we've we've had a a wonderfully adventurous life together. Yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, we we started making um, airplanes and. People started coming and saying, I want to help. I want to help. I want to help. And before long, we had a new whole new company, the Wright Brothers Aeroplane Company. And we've, we've now we've built uh, airplanes and uh, flight simulators for museums all over the world. So that's so uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was, did, it was, it was, did it, they, it's did, a leap sometimes. Was, they had the Wright Cycle Company. And then what was their airplane company called? The right company. It was the right company. So when you named yours Wright Brothers Aeroplane, that was a completely unique name that had never been used by. It had never the been Wright used. Brothers. It, it, okay. I, it, no, that what I wanted was I wanted was something was something that you could uh, if you were if you were googling on the internet, you would type in Wright Brothers and Aeroplane, and you would get to me, and it worked. We we. We get just a little shy of a million hits a year on the right on the Wright wow. Brothers Aeroplane Company website. Um, I'm, I, it's a it's a it's a um, uh, a destination for every uh, 16 year old kid who's got to write an essay and needs some place to plagiarize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Workshop Companion. That's the name of the book series. It's the uh, name of a website that I have visited for many, many years. And then lo and behold, this YouTube channel pops up called <laughs> the Workshop, Workshop Campaign. Campaign. Uh, tell us more about that. Well, the, the, uh, uh, the Workshop Companion, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, after, after the centennial of flight, you know, we had some, we, the, the Wright Brothers Airplane Company was up and down. We had some, uh, uh, real lean years, especially especially the um, uh, the years uh, right following following the Great Recession, the museum business, which is uh, which is what we depended on for our for our uh, our money for so for so long, our clients uh, is is uh, is very is very dependent on on people who have disposable incomes. And uh, can can give a hundred thousand dollars to a museum so that they can buy an airplane. And uh, uh, when the uh, Great Recession hit, uh, those people kind of melted off. And so we were we were uh, sucking wind there for a while. And then the uh, uh, China and India decided to to uh, uh, shore up their uh, aerospace museums, and and we had. Uh, we had a uh, uh, a lot of really really nice years and a lot of nice trips, met a lot of nice people worldwide, until COVID, mm -hmm. and COVID really hit the museum industry harder than the Great Recession. You know, not only did your did your sponsors go away, um, your uh, your your clientele did too. You couldn't have people in to the museum when when uh, when COVID. Uh, from experience, I know that it takes it takes the museum industry about five years to uh, to recover from something like that. And uh, I'm I, I'm in my seventies. I didn't want to wait, sit around and wait for the museum to do. And besides that, I'm just not the type of person that likes to sit around and wait. So um, I uh, Travis had helped me build airplanes uh, and uh, showed a great deal of interest in uh, in videos. He had seen some of the videos that I had did when I was with with Shopsmith. I was interested in in, in doing videos. I would have done I would have done uh, a bazillion more videos for Shopsmith had it not been for the Great Recession. And um, so we said, okay, well, let's see what we can do. So here I am starting uh, my fourth business, and uh, it's doing pretty well. I'd uh, say. It's it's a fantastic channel, Nick. I really enjoy it. Every every time one of them pops up on my phone, I get the notification because I <laughs> rang the bell. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I can't wait to go watch it. And there are times I'll admit I've watched it with the sound off and the in the, the closed captioning as best as Google was able to come up with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it wasn't appropriate for me to be watching a video. But it, it's they're that good. I really enjoy well, thanks. Them. Well, thanks. I, 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 that means a lot for you to say that. I, and, and I, I have, uh, 
uh, we're, we're, we're now building a global audience. You know, as you know, watching my videos, we do a lot of the videos with no talking. All, all, it, right. all it is is me just building something and showing how to build it. And uh, uh, only about a third of the people now that watch us are from the United States. The rest is global. And uh, uh, that, that is completely new to me. Uh, I mean, I had, I had some global clients when we, when, uh, we were building airplanes for museums, but uh, it's, uh, I, I tell you, this, this metric stuff is really tough. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you started putting that in, but that's great. Yes. Yeah, that's well, we, we did, when, we, when we started realizing that there were so many people that were watching us, we had to. You, you've yeah. got to play to your audience. You know, that's, well, that, if, you're going to, if you're going to, you know, if you're, if you're any sort of a teacher, You've got to you've got to sound out your students and find out what they need. And uh, two thirds of my audience needs me to talk in meters. Well, I mean, uh, let's be fair now. America is not alone in not embracing the metric system. There's actually Myanmar and I think Liberia. Yeah. So we're not alone. <laughs> yeah, but America is the only America is the only place in the world where a, we have convinced ourselves that the that the metric system is actually a deep state conspiracy to get uh, to, to get us to buy um, all, all new tape measures that have embedded chips in them so that Bill Gates will know every measurement that we make. The metric system is the tool of the devil. My car gets 40 rods to the hog's head, and that's the way I like it. Uh, the me- the that'll, that'll, probably, that'll probably be everywhere on the internet by tomorrow. Probably uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, so now you're an author, you're a YouTuber, whether you like it or not, you're a uh, YouTuber, which, you know, is public, public speaker, educator, entertainer, uh-huh. right? Um, you're a woodworker. What, uh, and this is almost the same question I asked before, but more different. What, what brings you the most joy of all the things that you do? Working with good people and T and, 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 uh, 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 Students, uh, I, I I look at my the when I t- when I've taught classes, I've always looked at the students as 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 uh, co-conspirators rather than rather than actual students. I mean, we're uh, learning learning woodworking is an adventure, and all I am doing is leading an expedition, and uh, uh, so I. I love the 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 give and take you have where everybody is discovering stuff for the for the first time. Even though it may be the 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 second or third or the two hundredth time that I've seen it, it's it's still nice to see it new in somebody else's eyes. I, I and 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 I and as I said before, I love what you can do by getting by getting a group of competent people together. And all running in the same direction for a little bit. It's a, it's an amazing what an adventure that can be. Neat. Uh, I'm a corporate trainer and and have been asked in the past. You know, I do the same training over and over and over again. Doesn't that get boring? But not at all. The, the no. content may change, but the audience changes, and that changes the course. It's unique every time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have never ever learned so much as when I was teaching. OK, I, I, I just learned in leaps and bounds when I was at the University of Cincinnati. It, it was it was absolutely amazing to me what I would I would come in because, first of all, I had to prepare for the classes. But then the students would bring in in in, in stuff and they would discover stuff that they wanted to share. So it was like I said, every class was an expedition, an adventure. And you had Paxton lumber down there. And in, in, in was flag lumber down there still? I didn't have much there? to do with Paxton, but they, but or with with flag. But Paxton, the guy who ran that, was a really good friend of mine. In fact, in fact, when I started making airplanes, he was the one that got me a good supply of Sitka spruce straight from Alaska, because because uh, we really we at that point at that time Sitka spruce was hard to come by. So the Wright brothers, by the way, had used red spruce from West Virginia, but that is all so over logged, you only run into a, a tree every now and then these days. Mm. So, but. Uh, and so and, what, what's, a, what's ahead for uh, Workshop Companion, the YouTube channel? 
Anything um, you can share? We we're taking this we're we're taking this uh, one day at a time. It it the the audience is yanking us this way and that. And like like I said, you've got to you've got to pay attention to what your students need, and uh, we're um, we're we're trying to we're trying to listen and uh, uh, give them what what they want, but also also uh, go two or three steps beyond that. If they give them what what we think uh, they will appreciate. So, and it's working, it's working, so. Fair enough. I, I just have always liked the deep dive you've taken into things and the fact that you you touch something and it's not simply, you know, hey, this is a, this is a bottle of glue. No, you, you point out something significant about why you use that model for your glue. And it's like, huh, that never dawned on me. And uh, I, I don't know. Um, how much thought you put into your scripting for things like that? I imagine we, you do as an author. Yeah, we, we no, we write very detailed scripts for these videos. I know that they come off as me just being flippant and off the cuff, but but they are they are laid out uh, uh, point by point by point. People people write in and say, well, you know, you covered it so well. Well, yeah, I, yeah I've written fifty <laughs> books. I know how to cover these things. So, yeah. so there, these, these are, are scripted every bit as detailed as my books were. That's smart. I don't script my videos, Nick, and it shows. That's why I have to do two videos for every one that you do. I have to do a follow-up <laughs> for all the things I forgot. What I forgot to say? Uh, well, <laughs> that still happens when you, when you, uh, whether you script them or not. Uh, you, you, you always discover. That's, that's why we did part, so parts one and parts two on several of our, our, uh, yeah. our videos. Now, have you been hit by any trolls? Do you have anybody who feels the need to correct you on every video? There's always, I mean, I, I, you have this in classes too. You are an instructor at, at, at shops. Yeah. You know that there's always that woodworker who's got, to, who's got to tell you how much he knows, you know? And it's amazing. It's amazing to me uh, when talking about the Wright brothers, how is there's always an historian in the room that knows ever so much more than you do, even though you've built 18 Wright airplanes. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, uh, but you know, my 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 um, my technique for for working with these people is let them be who they want to be. If they want to be the the most knowledgeable woodworker in the room, let them be it. You know, I the one thing the only thing that I I will do is if I feel somebody is putting out bad information on my channel, I will eliminate their their um, uh, their. Uh, uh, their post. Uh, I don't tell them that they're wrong because I do appreciate they're wanting to participate. But if it's bad information, I don't feel like I, I should let, I have to be the gatekeeper at that point. Yeah. You started in 1979. We've already established that. The company itself had kind of restarted when, when John Folkerth bought the company back in the mid 70s. So the 73. company, Shopsmith Incorporated, was only a few years old when you came on. I mean, and you were there very much for what I would call the modern heyday. They went from, you know, one one building to where you drove up I-75. How many Shopsmith buildings were there from corporate headquarters to factory to the HR and hands-on publishing was in one building, if I recall correctly. They're in plus front of had, Levitz. Plus they had a division in Missouri, remember? We had, oh, had, the Johnson, Johnson City or what was that? Johnson, uh, jo Johnson Plastics. Okay, we had we 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 it was um, in Springfield, uh, Springfield, Missouri. Um, yeah, we, we, they they uh, that was uh, that was the time. Well, okay, let's 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 do a quick history of Shopsmith, please, and and, please. and you can do it, and I'm, we're going to do it from this perspective. Shopsmith has always been. Ever since its its in, invention by Hans Goldschmidt, has always been an extremely capable tool in search of an extremely competent marketing team. And sometimes it has it, and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, yeah. and and uh, when uh, Magna Engineering started making the Shopsmiths in the late forties, you know, you had a group of extremely good naval engineers. I mean, these people were building boats and, and putting out you know, one Liberty ship after the other from the uh, San Diego docks. And uh, all of a sudden we won the war and there was nothing for them to do. So Hans Goldsmith said, 
I have an idea. And uh, six months later, six months later, they had the, for the first 10 ER off the line. Uh, I mean, these, these, these people were wartime engineers. They knew how to roll the product out. Yeah. They didn't know how to sell it. And uh, the, they got uh, an order for 300 of, of those 10 ERs from, um, from Montgomery, uh, Ward. Montgomery Ward and then nothing, absolutely nothing. And they're sitting there panicking when uh, one, uh, and I forget who it was, but one of the uh, vice president turned to the other vice president and said, let's take this out to these, this newfangled thing they call a shopping mall and see if we can uh, demonstrate it, maybe sell a few. And they did. I think they sold 20 that afternoon. And that, 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 that uh, told them what they needed to know. The shopsmith, because, it, you know, it's, it's, not, in, it's a not entirely uh, apparent when you're looking at a shopsmith that you're looking at a complete shop and that, and that will do good, competent, quality work if you know how to use it, it's a thinking man's tool, you know, it's not for everybody. And you, so it needs to be demonstrated. And so that's, that, that, uh, that was what, what put the shopsmith on the map at that time is they took it around to shopping mall after shopping mall after shopping mall and demonstrated it and showed people that you could do woodworking if you just thought a little bit outside the box. Okay. And, uh, uh, Shopsmith grew and grew and grew until Magnus sold out to Yuba and Yuba didn't have, wasn't the same, didn't have the same amount of competence. And uh, see, the Shopsmith limped along for a while in the, in the six, in the sixties, but, but basically it was dead in the water because Yuba didn't understand how you have to sell this thing. In 1973, Bob, uh, John Folkerth was out looking for parts for his, um, uh, his shopsmith, uh, sawsmith, uh, the radial arm saw that they put out for a while, went down to uh, Mississippi, was it? I think it was Mississippi. It was Mississippi, yep. And uh, found a warehouse full of, of tooling to make new shopsmiths. And so he bought that and uh, put, it, uh, put it back together. But the, the, the thing that the company understood under Larry Blank, almost from the beginning, is that you had to demonstrate this tool in order to sell it. Larry Blank put together the, the, the shopping mall uh, thing again. But then he went a step further. Hands-on Magazine was one of those important steps. All of a sudden, now we were, we were not only were we in the shopping malls, but we were in your mailbox. Um, you know, direct mail marketing had just been invented, and we were beginning to reach niche, mar niche markets like woodworkers. And uh, I mean, we actually, we actually won, Hands On Magazine actually won several awards from the Direct Mail Marketing Association because, uh, because of the, uh, how good we were at what we were doing. And all we were doing was showing them what the people, what the people at Magna engineered and showed at that shopping mall that first afternoon, what you can do with a shopsmith. Okay, you, you, know, you can build a birdhouse, <clears throat> you can build a porch, you can build a set of cabinets. You can build a nuclear aircraft carrier if you have enough wood, okay? <laughs> but it will do it. So um, uh, that that was what that was what happened. And then I got invited back to the Shopsmith. <laughs> Shopsmith ran into real problems when when they overexpanded. Um, in 1983, Shopsmith had doubled its money every year. Yeah, okay, it went from uh, 24, uh, $24 million in sales to $48 million in sales to $96 million in sales. And then suddenly in 1983, it only grew by 63%. And, that, and they had bought that, that company out in Missouri because they were looking for backward integration. They were going to make their own moldings and so on. And, that and was, wasn't that McGraw, like McGraw Edison owned it and we bought, I uh, say so we, Shopsmith bought it. Right. Was it McGraw that, Edison? But it was at a, yes. They had that little line of, of bench top tools, really, really cheap yeah. bench top tools. Yeah. But what Shopsmith bought it for is they had those that plastic molding factory. And they thought they thought that we could do a lot, a lot of the uh, the plastics that we were buying out there. But they also they also had this idea of 
of expanding and having a complete line of, of, of tools. They were, they were getting out way outside their comfort zone and their, 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 their core competence as, as it used to be called. Yeah. And, uh, uh, <coughs> but anyway, they had that they they only grew by sixty three percent, but they had spent a hundred percent more money, and uh, Shopsmith never recovered from that year. They never recovered. They were that from that moment on, they were chasing their own tail and and pulling back and pulling back and pulling back and pulling back until until uh, when I joined them again in the um, in the, briefly in two thousand and seven to run their their academy, they were down to about twenty people. They had been 1,500 people at one point, but um, we, you know, I looked at what they did and I said, okay, you know, the new, the new, the new uh, way to trade information now is video, and so I came up with Stata sessions. The uh, the uh, they brought me in to run the academy, but the academy was almost dead. You know, the the. Uh, uh, 9-11 had really, really changed the culture and how, how much people were willing to travel and go places that they hadn't been before. And uh, one of the places that they didn't want to go was the Shopsmith Academy, apparently. So I, I, when I got there, I started looking around for something else to do. And I said, okay, well, let's take the Academy out to the country. So I did those, those uh, 30 or 40 videos that, uh, for Shopsmith, the Sado sessions that they had before. Um, and those were live. You were streaming those live and then we were recording them. Live. So the, the, uh, as far as I know, I was the first woodworking instructor to actually stream woodworking instruction. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then what, what we did is we, we streamed those live and then we cut them up and we made uh, small videos out of them so that, so that Shopsmith would be able to use them over and over again. Heck, they're still using them, yeah. but uh, but the, the Great Recession hit, and um, uh, and those those things went away. But they were they were all when I was there. When I was there, when we had those videos going, we actually saw an eighteen percent growth in in sales. So uh, the videos were doing something, but yeah. uh, once again, I mean the the uh, uh, they got knocked back by the uh, the Great Recession, and now as far as I can see. Shopsmith is still an extremely capable tool, and it's still in in uh, in search of a competent marketer. Hmm. You know, yeah, I, it's, I, a, it's, a, it's a it's a sad story. It really is. Yeah. Um, Tra and, Travis and, Travis said to me the other day. He said, "You know, an eighteen year old with an iPhone could do a better job at social media than they're doing." You know, yeah. and it, it it's unfortunately true. Yeah, I mean, every now and then there's a there's a blind squirrel moment. <laughs> you go, hey, that was pretty good. <laughs> yep yep back in those early days a hands-on magazine you had this young mustachioed craftsman <laughs> who came to work <laughs> for you and uh and lo all these years later you had him on your channel right. um I, I was just shocked because i'm talking about jim mccann because jim used to come into the academy in dayton every now and then i would coerce him into coming in in doing a cameo to talk about sharpening or come mm -hmm. in and talk about finishing. And he was so nervous. And if a camera was in the room, oh my gosh, it, it would just, would it was a, a shrinking violet. That video tour of his shop was not only fantastic just from that content of, of hearing his, his uh, you know, his history with the tools and so on, but to see Jim, the way he is when he's just with you or just with me was fantastic. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Jim and I have that kind of kind of synergy. So, so part of it, part of it, I think, is is because of our relationship. The things, one of the things that absolutely amazes me about this type of woodworking is uh, we've been working long a, a long time together. And forty two years, forty two years. But a lot of it, a lot of it was was due to to Travis's uh, uh, ability to handle the situation. Travis was a ghost while we were doing that. I, I, <clears throat> I barely remember him being there. So he's, he's, you know, he's carrying around this great big, big camera. And I can't, I can't think of a single instance where I turned around and he was there. You know, wow. you look at the, you look at the video and you see him sometimes because he set up one camera to, uh, uh, 
to be there. But I think a lot of that is due to the fact that he just knows how to work himself in and get the job done without without making people know that they're on camera. Now, will the witness protection program allow Travis to put his face in front of the camera for just a moment? Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, hey Trav, you want to come over here and take a bow? <laughs> Guys, this. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! Look at this. We're we're mutton. We're mutton, Jeff. Travis is is what six two six, six three four and a quarter. Six four and a quarter. <laughs> I'm I'm five six. So it's it's just it, it it we're almost a cartoon couple when you see us together. You know, Travis is continually putting things on shelves that I can't reach. <laughs> I'm ninety five percent sure. That's why I hired. <laughs> But now, yeah. now, hold on a second, Nick. Your your bandsaw is the probably the perfect height for Travis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of our one of our uh, viewers wrote in and said, "Isn't that bandsaw a little high?" I thought I thought it is. It is for Travis, and not for me. I'm eating sawdust every time I use it. <laughs> <laughs> Travis, you're doing great work. Thank you very much. You really, <laughs> enjoyed, really enjoyed your work. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think I've uh, taken enough of your time, unless you've got something you'd love to to, to add at this point, Nick. Uh, any no, final no, thoughts? I've, I've, I've had a I've had a really good time talking with you about uh, about past glories and and uh, future adventures. So yeah, fantastic! Uh, I, I I don't get the Dayton much anymore. I used to. My my mother in law lived in Kettering until two years ago when she passed away, and so we we haven't been back there since. But uh, one of these days, I'll get a hankering for Marion's Pizza and a tour of the of the uh, Air Force Museum, and I'll come a calling. I guarantee that. But uh, thank you, thank you so much for your time, Nick, and again oh, for all all your hard work. Really, really enjoy what you're doing, and keep it up. Same to you, same to you, and and uh, thanks for this opportunity. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. All right, all right. Hey, viewers, make it a great week, and we'll see you again. Thing, yeah. one thing we got to do before I leave. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>